Ms. Bovard, is cancel culture real? It certainly is, sir. 62, a recent survey, 62% of the American people said they're afraid to freely express their thoughts and opinions. I think most Americans agree that it's, it's darn real, it's scary. I think Professor Teachout just, I think the quote she just said, uh, closed and fearful system that we find ourselves in. If 62% of the American people are afraid to express themselves, do you have a functioning First Amendment? Uh, you don't. It would seem that would violate the very intent of the First Amendment, which is to provide a robust protection for speech of all kinds. Yeah, silence is not the First Amendment, and that's exactly what the cancel culture mob is wanting. They're wanting us to be silent. In fact, I think it's even worse. They want us to agree with them. Do you have free speech if only one side is allowed to talk? You, you do not. You have one source of information only that is not free speech or free thought, I would add. Yeah, so if you don't have free thought, you don't have free speech, you have a closed and fearful system, you have a system where 62% of the American people are afraid and reluctant to express their thoughts, their opinions, that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous place to be. Is big tech a part of this phenomena we now find ourselves in? I would say absolutely. I think that the bias that we've discussed is a symptom, actually, of its market power. Uh, Google filters information for 92% of the world, 87% of America. So whatever they choose to amplify or suppress is what billions of Americans, or, or sorry, billions of people around the world see. That's a problem. It strikes, me as it's it strikes me as twofold. One, they can censor themselves. We know about that. We know what Google tried to do to the Federalists. We know what Twitter will do to the President of the United States, but yet then turn around and let the Ayatollah of Iran spew the things that he wants to spew. So they can engage in it themselves, but then they also provide a platform for other people to attack and, and try to cancel opinions they disagree with. Now, I don't know how we deal with that. We just got to fight back and, and, and be able to use the platform and, and, and fight back with that. But that second part, Barry Weiss actually called, Barry Weiss, the, the individual had to resign or who did resign, or if she had to, she resigned from the New York Times. She called that second phenomenon the digital thunderdome, a term that I just thought struck me as exactly what happens when the mob starts attacking positions they don't like. So it seems to me we come to the, the critical question, what's the answer? How do we address it? Well, I think I would actually go back to something that Ms. Hubbard actually referenced in her opening statement, which is that the answer, the antidote to bad speech and suppression of speech is more speech. And I think- Always uh, has been in this yeah. country, always has been. So whatever incentives that Congress can give uh, through the tools that, you know, they already are involved with these tech companies with Section 230 with sort of this antitrust immunity that, that they've given these tech companies, whatever incentives that Congress can give these companies to abide by what we, uh, in Section 230, designed for, right, which is robust political debate, a diversity of views, I think it's incumbent upon Congress to do that. Um, seems to me that it seems I agree with that, and, and it, uh, I want you to take a good look at the legislation I briefly referenced in my opening comments, legislation that we've introduced today. Um, it seems to me that would be something we could all agree on, because there's definitely some disagreement. We heard what Ranking Member Sensenbrenner said. We heard how, we've heard what folks on the Democrat side said about is existing antitrust law good enough? Or the truth is, I don't know. It may be, it may not be. Do we have to change it? Well, we'll look at that. Is it more robust action, as some of the Democrat witnesses have said, from the agencies? Uh, probably all, all of that's important. But it seems to me we should be able to agree on Section 230 and what needs to be changed there to foster more speech and not allow these big uh, tech companies to censor, particularly, I think, censor, censor conservatives. Would you agree with that? I would. I think the, there's a lot of proposals to reform Section 230, which I think reflects the sentiment that you just suggested, which is that they all have one goal, which is to force more accountability on these platforms for speech, uh, for the criminal acts that flourish there. And I think it's a, it's a very important uh, area to address. To your point, I do think this is a multi-pronged problem that is going to probably require multi-pronged approaches right. across different sectors of policymaking. Section 230 is one of them. And, and you know what else I think is important? I think you have to call it out every single time you see it. Every time big tech censors somebody, it should be called out, particularly now. I mean, particularly now, four and a half weeks before a major election. I mean, maybe the biggest election. And, and we know what happened in 2016. We know what Google tried to do to help the Clinton campaign. So you have to call it out every single time. And then hopefully we can get some bipartisan support for the Section 230 changes that I think everyone, if we all just sit down and work, we all agree need to happen. I'll give you the last word for the last 15 seconds. 
I would agree with that because I would like to get to a point where these big tech giants don't have nearly the power they have uh, over speech, over election, over independent behavior. I do not think we can function as a free society when we are ruled by tyrannical corporations.